In our study of these first few chapters of Genesis, we're in the fourth chapter today. We'll be reading verses 1 through 26 of the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. This is a story to know well. We'll see if we know it a bit better by the end. Listen to the word of the Lord. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and flute. Zillah also had a son, Tubalcain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubalcain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I had to do the yawn thing with the kids. Uh, we had that story in the first service, but you were really terribly disappointing to me, I'm sorry to say. Um, like I said, when this a cappella group was about to sing and this one guy gave this big yawn, almost the entire audience was yawning before he was through, and he got great joy in pointing out those who had caught his yawn. And uh, I wasn't merely speaking hypothetically about the effect of bad moods and how catching they can be. I pray that good moods would be catching as well, but they're not as powerful as the bad moods. You may have noticed that yourself. The only time that I got uh, righteously indignant and confrontational as a pastor, the only time I can remember, happened one Christmas Eve. You remember that Christmas Eve that was on a Sunday? And that day, we had communion at the first but not at the second. First, Pres Roanoke Rapids didn't have a pastor, so I was doing their Christmas Eve service. Then I was doing another Christmas Eve service where they were having communion. So it's Christmas Eve. I'm all fired up. You know how I get with worship. And so I'm just flying high. We get the first service through. And as I'm getting in my car, this is the moment one of my elders decided to dump on me this complaint that she'd been building up for a while, um, a complaint about which I would be able to do nothing. I think I was leaving town shortly thereafter. It was the end of the year. It was the end of the month. It was Christmas Eve, for heaven's sakes. I could not fix the problem. And her complaint wasn't entirely unfounded, but the timing was terrible. We had just been in worship. We'd just been at the table together. And now she's telling me about all those people and what a bad job they're doing. And they're not taking care of these people. And we need to do thus and such. And at the time, I can be a little bit more confrontational now because I've done this longer. But at the time, the best I could come up with was this. Let's just make a New Year's resolution 
that when I get back and in the beginning of January, you come to me and we'll work out a solution to this problem. But we have just been in worship and we just had communion and I'm going to worship and I got two more services today and I don't want to have to deal with this complaint on Christmas Eve. She never came to me to fix the problem. I'd forgotten that story. That's kind of important. It'll tell you a little bit about that individual. I'm very sorry to say, but she was more interested in complaining and dumping this on me on Christmas Eve morning because then she could go off and have Christmas, whereas I fumed the entire drive over to the next church 20 minutes and I am steaming about this Christmas Eve present I had been given right after worship, right after communion. It is the sort of thing, that, by the way, that really discourages a pastor. It makes me think that you weren't listening to me at all. You have no idea what we're doing in worship. I caught her bad mood really quickly and she kind of liked that. Sophie and I just recently read a book that takes place in 1918, uh, which is not just a World War I reference, but of course, you historians will know that was the Spanish influenza outbreak. And it was rather unnerving to read about that flu. We've had some pretty serious bugs come up in the last 20 years or so, uh, but this was a terrifying influenza virus. Um, people could feel tired on Tuesday night and be dead by Wednesday night. Um, and lots and lots. Uh, 94 years ago, October 1918, 200,000 Americans died in a month from this flu. We still don't know how many people died worldwide. I mean, you have to factor in the war as well as, but somewhere between 50 and 100 million people died. And it came fast, and it was terrifying, and at the time we didn't exactly know what to do about it. The book Sophie and I read... Um, there was a system of quarantine, sort of, but the doctors were so very shorthanded that um, once somebody in your family got sick, usually you pretty much had to stay at home and hope that the doctor came by. And, uh, and horrible things happened with that flu. Spread like wildfire. So fast, so dangerous, so deadly. Not what you were thinking about when I read this story, but here's the problem. We know the Cain and Abel story, and oh, isn't that tragic? And you may have forgotten about Lamech. I hope you won't forget about him again. He is a bad dude. He is a terrible guy and did terrible things and said terrible things. And all of Cain's descendants, while they had their achievements, uh, were definitely laboring under this curse of... Not necessarily Cain, but what had happened that we saw last week. We're tempted to think of the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve broke a rule. And we don't really understand the rule exactly. And it didn't sound like it was a very fair rule. And the tree was right there. And it was asking a lot of God to think that Adam and Eve wouldn't be able to eat from that fruit. Plus, the serpent tricked them in the first place. And then if you ask Adam what happened to him, well, he said Eve deceived him. Uh, it was that woman that you gave me that caused me to do that. But I told you last week, I think that the whole world sort of shifted a little bit, just had a little tilt on its axis as soon as that happened. And we can see in this story how very fast this disease is spreading through all of creation, and particularly among human beings. It is deadly, it spreads like wildfire, and it's getting worse all the time. It's like when you uh, drop some ink into a big thing of water and you first start seeing it spread out. But before long, the entire container has been tainted and colored by that. That's what's happening here. Adam and Eve have their first son, Cain, and she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought him forth, and then had Abel, and then they grow up. And as far as we can tell, things are going fine. We hear nothing about their childhood, but once they're old enough to do work, they do two separate jobs. Cain follows in his father's footsteps. Uh, Adam was a gardener, once in Eden. Now he's out in the world, and by the sweat of his brow is he bringing forth food. And Cain joins him in that. He works the soil. Abel keeps the flocks, goats and sheep and whatever flocks we have. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. That shouldn't cause you alarm necessarily. But what's weird to me is the sacrifice situation puzzles a lot of people. And we don't exactly know why Cain was, was no good, but Abel's was good. And I don't think it's as confusing as it looks like. But we will see that even in worship, Cain has been tainted by sin. This disease is spreading crazily and has already affected him. See, Adam and Eve, they're just kind of... They're kind of childish in the way that they deal with God. They sneak around, they eat the fruit, then, oh, we're found out, God's here, they hide from God. Cain, on the other hand, when Cain finally commits his worst sin, he's defiant, he's rebellious. He's not sneaking around, he's not worried that God might catch him. He is just as brazen as can be, and he lies about it to God's face. If we saw last week how sin disrupted the relationship between God and human beings, and, importantly, between husband and wife, where we see Adam go from jumping up and down, cheering over this wife that has been brought to him, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and then within the verses goes, that woman you put here, she gave it to me and I ate. 
husband and wife relationship has been not destroyed, but seriously damaged. Now we see that even within the family, and from there it's going to go out to all humankind, where relationships have been disrupted, have been possibly destroyed as this sin spreads so quickly. Cain brought some of the fruits of the, of the earth as an offering to the Lord. And so it is important for us to see Cain's worshiping. That's good. Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. So sorry, Bill Schlachter's not here today. Because this will really preach about stewardship. And the first service got a big taste of it. And I can only give you the tiniest hint about stewardship and about giving. But here's the thing. People say, what? Was it that God just liked Abel better and Cain he didn't like as much and that's why he didn't like Cain's offering so much? Is there some favoritism going on here? And that's just the serpent still talking. The serpent still trying to convince us God is not good, God is not loving, God is not fair, God can't keep his word. If he does keep his word, it's going to be bad for us. That's still the serpent's talk. It's actually pretty clear. Cain knew he was supposed to bring something to God. What have I got around? I got some of this. Here you go, God. Now I've done my thing. He did it his way, he did it on his own terms, and he gathered what he had. Abel, on the other hand, took some of the firstborn of his flock, and then he took the very best parts of them and brought them to God. So it's not that Cain couldn't help it and Abel's turned out to be better. Cain wasn't trying. Cain was going through the motions so that he wouldn't get in trouble with God and fulfilling the minimum requirements, whereas Abel was taking a risk, a sacrificial risk. This is why this is about stewardship. Why is it best to give from the firstborn of the flock and the very best parts of that? The firstborn of the flock is a scary, risky, faith-filled thing to do. Because if you're somebody who's a shepherd, and now this sheep has given its firstborn, you think, okay, we're going to make it now. Because we have a young one, and from that young one, other young ones will come. And so there's security now because the first one's here. But when God asks the people to redeem the firstborn, what he's saying is, yes, I provided for you. Now, are you willing to trust that I'll provide the rest as well? If you sacrifice the firstborn, never happened in 2012, by the way. Never sacrifice the firstborn animal because, wait, 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 that's my guarantee, right? That's my savings account if you're a shepherd. Here, I've got this one. The next one, God, you can have that one. That's not what God asked for. The firstborn, because I will take care of the rest. So your tiny little freebie about giving to the church is this. If we approach giving in terms of taking care of all of our obligations, make sure all the bills are paid, make sure the savings account is taken care of, everything else is taken care of, and then, okay, what are we going to do with this rest? Maybe we can give some to the church. That will be fine. Sort of. It's not fine. If, on the other hand, we make that a priority, not because we need to pay the bills and not because we need to keep the lights on, and that drives George crazy when I say that. But that's really not why we give. We give because we are trusting God to take care of us, this church as well as ourselves. And if we give as the primary uh, obligation, as the first priority, you will find, because it's promised in Scripture, that you will not run out by the end. You will not find that giving to the church will set you back. Ooh, will set you back. Uh, but you can often find that taking care of everything else first will set your giving back. But that's just a freebie. Some other day we'll talk about that. I just want you to get this. It's not that Abel's cooler than Cain and God likes him better. It's that Abel gave an acceptable offering because he tried to give the very best to God. And Cain was doing it on his own terms, in his own way, and he gathered some of what he had and said, how about this? And God said, not good enough. Not good enough. Did not give with faith, did not give from his heart, whereas Abel did. And Cain knows it. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and on his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with, with favor, and Cain was very angry. In the Bible, when somebody's very angry, usually somebody's about to die, and that's what happens here. Very angry is a, is a big deal. His face is downcast, and then the Lord says, Why are you angry? Why are you downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? And he's not talking about what Cain's going to do. He's actually talking about the worship and the sacrifice and the offering right now. But he knows what else is happening. If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. The King James was couching at your door. Even the Revised Standard Version kept that for a long time. Sin is couching at your door. But we don't use that word that way. It just means crouching, lurking. Peter describes sin or describes the devil as a ravenous lying out, prowling, about to pounce it's crouching, lurking at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must master it. This gives Cain an opportunity to turn things around. This gives Cain an opportunity to live the way that he's supposed to live. Now God has once more given him instruction. Here's the deal. It's just as God always does. 
All right, you're on a road. This way goes to death. Don't go that way, Cain. This road leads to life. Why don't you go that way? Cain says, fine, God, thanks for your suggestion. Walks out, says, hey, Abel, let's go out to the field together. And he attacks his brother and kills him. Have you noticed, by the way, that Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and everybody else are out of the Garden of Eden, but they're still having conversations with God? Lest we believe the serpent's lies that God kicked them out of the garden because he was mad at them and didn't like them anyway. God is still talking with them. Back and forth conversation here when they have been banished from Eden. That's a significant thing. God has not abandoned the sinner. God is still giving opportunity for them to be redeemed, for them to be forgiven. Cain kills Abel. The Lord says, Cain, where is your brother Abel? It's not that God doesn't know. Just like the questions to Adam and Eve in the garden. He's not looking for information. He's looking for a confession. Where is your brother Abel? Whereas Adam at least told the truth in the garden, even if he was slightly petulant about it, he told the truth. Cain lies, outright lies. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He's making a joke out of it. And maybe it's the joke is that, you know, Abel's keeping his flocks and I'm supposed to keep him like he keeps his animals. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, the ground itself cries out to me because of the blood that was shed at your hands, your brother's blood spilled on the ground. Then Cain is driven out. A curse lies upon you now. And it's hard again to determine, is God saying, I curse you? Or is God saying, now that you've done this, now a curse is on you. And I wish you hadn't done that. That's what I said. That's what I meant when I said, don't do this. Go this other way. But instead, this has happened. Now you're under a curse. You're driven from the ground. When you work it, it won't yield its fruit for you. So you, the gardener, will not be able to garden successfully. And you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain, still unrepentant, cries out indignantly my punishment is more than i can bear it's too much no it's really not because the proper punishment for killing your brother is that boom you're dead and you're still alive so i'm not so sure your punishment is more than you can bear but he thinks it is you're driving me from the land i'll be hidden from your presence i'll be a restless wanderer and whoever finds me will kill me that's an interesting idea but the lord said not so If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over and put a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. And Cain went out. This promise of God and this mark, which might seem like a mark of protection, and in a sense it is, God is saying, when anyone sees this mark, they will know that they will suffer seven times over if they do anything to you. Cain might have found comforting, but if you think about it for very long, he probably found it extremely discomforting. Here's why. God puts a mark on Cain and says, nope, you are not able to avenge Abel's death. Sorry, didn't even see that coming. Able to avenge Abel's death. You are not able to touch him. I am protecting him. Why? That mark, among other things, is saying, because he's mine. I'll deal with Cain. You don't get to. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so in a sense, even though he is putting this huge mark of protection on him, you'd better not touch him or horrible things will happen to you. Cain has to think, but if they don't exact justice, who's going to? And God is saving that for himself. Cain lay with his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Where would she come from? Some of you asked me that last week. Uh, in Bible study, we got asked that. Okay, so Cain had a wife, which we don't know her name, and she just shows up. Where would she come from? The short answer is, I don't know. There are lots of possible solutions to the problem, including the fact that people are living for hundreds of years, as we'll see in two weeks' time when we get to chapter 5. People living a very, very, very long time. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. And so the simplest solution seems to be that because people were living a long time, having lots of children, people were spreading out, that eventually there was some sister out there that Cain could marry. And that has probably been the traditional idea of the church for, oh, a couple thousand years. Fine. Short answer is, I don't know. But there were other people. Same thing. Cain says, if anyone finds me, they're going to kill me. What, your brothers are going to kill you? And actually, they might have. Who is he worried about finding him? There seem to be other people that he's scared of or other people that he thinks he's going to need to be scared of in three or 400 years' time. But I don't know. It's a fascinating thing. Evidently not important for the story for us to know that, or I guess we would know. But I find it interesting, and I'm really not sure. So they got this son, Enoch, and Cain is building a city. What? Wait, you're supposed to say, he's a restless wanderer on the earth. And he's building a city. It sounds like he's settling down. Oh, he's building a city, but he is not settling down. If God declares that he'll be a restless wanderer, as long as we are able to avoid that temptation to say, wait, God said restless wanderer, now he's got a city. Maybe God didn't mean it. 
understand this, that Cain has been banished from the presence of the Lord. We don't see any other conversations between God and Cain. And he can have a city, and he can have a house, and he can have a fortress, but that doesn't mean that he is settled in his heart with God or with other people. His relationship with everyone has been broken by this act of his. And so I don't think that even though he builds a city, that Cain ever was settled, but always wandering, at least in his heart, if not in actuality, with his family, with his friends, if he had any, with God, always separated. Then a short little genealogy. Uh, the Enoch had a son. His son, Radira, had a son, Mehujahel. Mehujahel had a son, Methushael. And Methushael was the father of Lamech, who was a bad guy. Great, great, great grandson of Cain. I told you this disease, this disease of sin, has not only affected the entire creation, but also is spreading like crazy throughout the family of people, the very few people that we know about. We know these few names. And it gets to Lamech, and already you see how far it's progressed. How bad off the patient is. We are in deep trouble already. Here's one reason. Lamech married two women. And you're thinking, right, they do that in the ancient world. In fact, I think in some parts of the world today, they still do that. That's true and not the right reaction. Lamech married two women and you're supposed to all go, oh, no. In fact, you could just duck and cover because this is bad news. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united, cleave to his wife, singular, and the two will become one flesh. That's the plan. That's what Adam and Eve were given. And that is the idea that God is trying to carry forward here. And instead, Lamech says, no, I think I'll marry two women who had very nice names. And I'm sure they were very nice ladies and they were married to an awful person. Uh, Ada means jewel. Zilla means melody. And jewel and melody have to live with this horrible guy who is no gem and uh, who is always disrupting any harmony there might be. Married two women. They had children. This is your quick little how things came to be lesson in Genesis. So Jabal was the father of all the Bedouin tribes, those who live in tents and raise livestock. And his brother Jubal was the father of musicians everywhere, harp and flute and all those. And Tubal Cain was the father of blacksmiths and metal workers of all kind and all of that. And by the way, Tubal Cain had a sister. Fascinating. Why do we know about Nama? I don't know, because we never see her again. Here's how bad Lamech is, and here's how bad the situation is, that they found themselves in, and think how bad it must be now, all these thousands of years down the road. Lamech said to his wives, and it's set apart as poetry, he's practically singing it to them. Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. The injury he's talking about is bruise. This young man bruised me, so I killed him. Because I could. Because I'm powerful, and I'm stronger than he is, and I'm more important than he is, and I'm just meaner than anybody else. It doesn't take very much thinking. It helps if you start with movies. And I hope you don't have to go very far into your own life to, uh, to think about this. Hopefully you were not ever oppressed by somebody like this. Somebody who was bigger, stronger, and meaner, and knew it, and would do what they wanted to do to anybody. It certainly still happens in the world. We see that in all sorts of dictators, uh, the way that they go about things. They're not always bigger, but they're usually a little bit stronger, and mostly they're meaner and willing to do things that normal people don't do. Great, 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 great grandson. Adam and Eve broke the rule, which turned out to be much worse than that. Cain murdered his brother, and now Lamech is boasting about his thirst for vengeance. He loves it. He is bloodthirsty. He bruised me, so I killed him. And if anyone wants to kill me, if Cain is avenged seven times, 77 times for me, that's how much greater I am than Cain. That's not a great boast. You don't want to be a more important, more infamous guy. Than Cain, but that was his boast. We've hardly gotten started in the story of humanity when all of a sudden we realize everything is coming apart. Society is coming apart. We've got these strong men who are lording it over everybody else, oppressing everybody around them. Everything seems to be going wrong. All the world is ripe for judgment. Next chapter, a name's going to pop up, and that name is Noah very beginning everything's going wrong and judgment is coming and what is going to happen next 
Well, the nice thing about Genesis is that particularly after you hear the bad news, you're given just a little snippet of, okay, it's going to be okay. And we're given that at the end of the chapter. Just so you know, stick with the story. It will be all right eventually. Unfortunately, you have to get a lot past Genesis before the story really becomes all right. But Adam and Eve have another son, and his name is Seth. And he replaces Abel, granted me another child. And Seth had a son and named him Enosh. And then people began to call on the name of the Lord. They began to worship. Maybe they began to worship again through Seth's line, through the people who began to worship God. Hope will dawn. Help is coming. Salvation awaits. Well, just these very few generations after Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, we have this man boasting about his power and boasting in his arrogance and boasting about persecuting and oppressing others and the power he has over others even to kill. If I'm right, if this disease of sin has been spreading out into all the world and been spreading down through the generations and is getting worse and worse all the time, then where do we find ourselves today? Well, we find ourselves in a big lot of trouble. And you don't have to look very far for that. Uh, one of the prayer concerns for today, if you had a chance to check the news this morning, but in the capital of Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, this morning, uh, little children went to Sunday school. And there was an attack at Sunday school, and it specifically targeted the Sunday school part of the building, and grenades were thrown, and children died today in church. Just going to Sunday school. So it's fine to talk about the Spanish flu and it's fine to talk about what's going on nowadays. But what we need to hear in this situation is things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. Not at all the way that God wanted. And what is to be done about it? At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord in worship, but maybe also to call on the name of the Lord asking for help. But there is good news coming. The way that Hebrews puts it is that we have been called to a new relationship and called to a new order of things. We have been called to come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to come to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood is shed senselessly without point, without meaning, without any hope of redemption. Jesus comes and spills his blood not only to redeem Cain and Abel and all the sins of the world all this time, but to save you and me from a world that in many ways is going terribly, terribly wrong. The thing that we can proclaim, the good news we have to share with the world, is that sin and death and all that threatens us, body and soul, has been conquered in Jesus Christ, the one coming from Seth's line, the line of promise, the one coming to set all things right and make all things new. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord God, in the midst of our lives and in the midst of the headlines and in the midst of bad news, it is hard to remember that you are God and you are sovereign over all things and that you have a plan for this world and that you have made us part of that plan, a plan of salvation for each of us, but also for this world, that you sent Jesus Christ to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world the one who conquered sin and death and all that is going so wrong and all that is opposed to your purposes in the world. And finally, far from Genesis and Revelation, we hear Jesus declare, Behold, I make all things new. Wonder of all, you have made each of us new, a new creation if we are in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come, that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Help us so to live. 